observations, but the main research interest is sarcoma. And originally we had the Rain and Sarcoma, sarcoma Boot Camp by Dr. Dusenberry, who did, had it up in the cities. And she kind of started mostly for the U of M people. And then when we got the male people involved, we said, you know, we probably should try to do something halfway in between. Looking at the, the map, Cannonballs is the closest half in between. So last year we had our first uh, together where we kind of shared just to bring everybody up to speed on sarcoma so everybody knows what we're talking about and then um, have a lot of the events the rest of the year. So that's kind of why we, we've done this. So a lot of the physicians from the advisory board are volunteering their time. Dr. Hurley's here to volunteer his time to kind of share with a little bit of oversight about this as well and then we're here to kind of just learn and absorb, but uh, definitely just here to kind of exchange ideas. So, so um, actually got into medical oncology through pharmacy. I was actually an oncology pharmacist in the 80s, 1980s, and uh, actually uh, decided to go to medical school and Walter Medical School. Um, uh, worked as an oncology pharmacist at the University of Wisconsin Medication Board. And, uh, you know, kind of got into hematology and oncology due to some of that background, but also due to some really excellent mentors in the hematology and oncology program at the University of, so, at the University of Wisconsin. I came here to do my fellowship many years ago. My, uh, my current hobby within medicine is actually global health. So I'm probably one of the few oncologists that also board certified in global health and, and do some work. Actually, uh, I have kind of had a long-term project in southern Tanzania for 16, 17 years. And we do an interdisciplinary global health uh, rotation there for medical students, pharmacy students, nursing students, masters of health, care administration students, and family medicine residents in January. We do that for eight or nine years. And Katie Dusenberry, you'll meet Katie later on tonight, a radiation oncologist, she and I have worked with a small group of people to develop a cancer center in northern Tanzania. So that's my, my hobby within this is, is global health. Um, uh, we talked for 15, 20 minutes here, kind of an overview of, of sarcomas. And of course, sarcomas are cancers of connective tissue. You know, um, for the most part, mesenchymal origin. In fact, all of them are of mesenchymal origin, except for kind of the, the malignant nerve, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, which are ectodermal in origin. And we think of you know, cartilage, bone, uh, soft tissue, muscle, etc. Most sarcomas are soft tissue cartilage sarcomas, and only a fraction, a small fraction, are actually bone-related tumors. Um, uh, there are over 50 subtypes of soft tissue cartilage sarcomas, and many of those uh, subtypes are identified kind of by their potential cell origin. So uh, uh, sarcomas of adipose tissue are liposarcomas. Sarcomas of, of, of smooth muscle are liomyosarcomas. Sarcomas of of blood vessels are angiosarcomas, right? It's actually, a, so, so over 50 different subtypes of, um, of, of soft tissue sarcomas, compare that to breast cancer. So there are probably two main histologic subtypes of breast cancer, you know, ductal and lobular, and maybe four kind of biologic subtypes of breast cancer. But over 50 of sarcoma, lung cancer. There are four main uh, histologic subtypes of lung cancer. Prostate cancer is only one. There's just prostate cancer, it's an endocarcinoma, you know, but 50 different, over 50 different subtypes of, uh, of, um, uh, of soft tissue sar sarcomas. Of course, breast cancer is much more, much, much, much more common than soft tissue sarcomas. There are maybe 10,000, 15,000 cases of sarcoma uh, in the United States uh, each year, where, as you know, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer in, in women. I want to point out for a second, uh, breast cancer is quite common, and there's a lot of great resources devoted to breast cancer. Many of you have heard of the breast cancer three-day walk and the, the race for the cure on Mother's Day, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of outstanding patient advocacy groups for uh, breast cancer. Uh, you are sitting at the only patient advocacy group, certainly in Minnesota, uh, for sarcoma. Uh, that, that is this, that's these guys right here, you know. And uh, they have done some incredible work uh, networking with other small 
uh, sarcoma patient advocacy groups uh, nation and worldwide. We actually get together at our annual oncology conferences to do a patient advocacy uh, uh, group as well. So, uh, so again, a lot of interesting stuff to work with breast cancer because it's very common. But this is the sarcoma patient advocacy group right here. You're, you're part of that now. This is a, a, a histogram of, uh, of different histologic subtypes of soft tissue sarcomas from a large uh, population of sarcomas at Memorial Sloan Kettering over about a 25 year period, uh, here from 82 to 2009. And you can see a rough breakdown of more common histologic subtypes. So liposarcomas and lanomyosarcomas are relatively common. Undifferentiated pleomorphous sarcomas, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, we'll talk more about in a second. Synovial sarcomas, fibrosarcomas, sarcomas, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, and a more wastebasket category of, of other types of, of, of tumors. Um, we uh, distinguish different types of soft tissue sarcomas pathologically, as you know, and and simplistically speaking, much of that is histologically. So what what these cells look like under the microscope, and you can imagine with over 50 different subtypes that the histologic uh, or the morphology of, of soft tissue sarcomas is really varied. So you can see up here on the left uh, this picture of a gastrointestinal stromal tumor uh, underneath the microscope, kind of a spindly, swirly pattern of cells underneath the microscope. Compare that to something like Ewing's sarcoma, which is considered something called a round blue cell tumor that could be easily be mistaken for uh, a lymphoma or a small cell lung cancer. So very different histologic appearance to these. We also use immunohistochemistry to, to identify cells of origin and subtypes of sarcomas. And you're likely familiar with immunohistochemistry. It's essentially a pathologic way for looking at cell surface expression of different proteins that can characterize um, certain, uh, certain types of tumors. Uh, I think one of the more classic ones is using the stain for CD117 or CKIT to identify gastrointestinal stromal tumors. We also use uh, you know, uh, molecular diagnostics, uh, including uh, studies looking at chromosomal changes, fish studies, and uh, next generation sequencing to help uh, distinguish different types of sarcomas as well too. And of course, uh, you're probably aware that pathologic grading is incredibly important in understanding the biology of, of, of cancers. And pathologic grading, and again, as you are aware, is simplistically um, having our pathologist help us understand how organized versus disorganized a cancer could be. Uh, and the more complex and disorganized, the more nuclear and cellular pleomorphism and heterogeneity, and the higher the mitotic figure rate, the higher the grade of that cancer. What's very interesting about sarcomas, soft tissue sarcomas, is it's really only one cancer I can think of where grading is actually, uh, the, the histologic grade is actually part of the staging system. We think of most, and we'll talk about staging a little bit, most of the staging for uh, cancers is the TMM staging classification for the that tumor, the nodes, metastases, well, soft tissue sarcomas, histologic grade is actually part of that as well, too. I kind of like to take a moment to talk about uh, kind of a sarcoma in medical history, so to speak. Because I think there's kind of some fascinating things that we uh, sometimes overlook or don't don't think about. Um, back in 1911, a uh, researcher by the name of uh, Peyton Rouse identified the Rouse sarcoma, or postulated that there was something called the Rouse sarcoma virus. This is a, a picture from the 1911 Journal of Experimental Medicine uh, a paper that he published, and he was interested in sarcomas that were affecting chickens. And he was able to take a cell-free extract of, of those tumors and inoculate other chickens and was able to show that he could uh, essentially uh, transmit sarcomas from one chicken to the other using a cell-free extract. The interesting part about that is he actually won the Nobel Prize for that 55 years later in 1966. My understanding is that's like the longest uh, uh, interlude between like a scientific discovery and actually winning the Nobel Prize for that 55 years. Um, what's also interesting about that is there were several other Nobel Prizes awarded to the Rouse sarcoma virus kind of stuff. Howard Tennant, who was a, a actually he was a, a researcher at Ricardo Lab in University of Wisconsin back when I was an undergrad, uh, 
received a Nobel Prize in like 1975 or 76 for understanding that, that Ross Circumoth virus is a retrovirus. And then Harold Varmus, who was the recent head of the NIH and has been the head of the Memorial Sloan uh, Kettering Cancer Center, uh, I believe received a Nobel Prize in like 1989 or 90 for identifying the cellular origin of the SARC uh, oncogene as well too. Uh, an apparently famous surgeon uh, wrote the very first textbook of neoplastic disease, a 1,000 page treatise that he wrote, he was the sole author of that, James Ewing, who, whose namesake is now on a, a very um, uh, distinct form of, of sarcoma called, uh, called the Ewing sarcoma. Um, back when I was in medical school and in my early residency program, the biggest challenge to healthcare in the late 80s and 90s and early 2000s was actually HIV. We don't think that much about HIV, and even in the places of the world where it's still a huge problem, Sub-Saharan Africa, we're getting on top of that. But it's interesting to remind ourselves that the HIV epidemic was characterized by a funny sarcoma and a funny infection that happened in men living in San Francisco and in New York City. So the first early description of HIV, the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report in 1981, described these cases of this funny sarcoma, Kaposi sarcoma, and this funny pneumonia, pneumocystis pneumonia, in immunosuppressed men. Um, I think Scott will also uh, agree that if you've been in oncology long enough, there's been a whole bunch of like eras in oncology treatment, you know. Starting back uh, in the 70s and 80s, it was like the interferon era where we were really excited about interferon, that would be the drug that did everything. And interferon has a small role in oncology these days. And then it was the monoclonal antibody era, and we're still kind of the monoclonal antibody era, so it's, it's been a success. And a, and a, a kind of a, a, a angiogenesis era and whatnot. And then came along the tyrosine kinase era, and we're actually still in the tyrosine kinase era. But in 2001, uh, a particular tyrosine kinase inhibitor of Matnib or Gleevec made it on the cover of Time magazine with this uh, heading. There's a new ammunition in the war on cancer, and these are the bullets. And um, that work had to do with a particular tyrosine kinase inhibitor of Matnib that was found to be particularly beneficial in a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia. It's amazing how how that drug has completely changed uh, how we treat CML these days. The University of Minnesota, when I was a fellow there in the 1990s, uh, was world famous for doing bone marrow transplants for CML. Now we treat all those people with a pill, right? But what was soon found out within several months of this drug becoming available was that it was also incredibly effective for a particular type of soft tissue sarcoma called gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So imatinib is, is a tyrosine kinase that inhibits the bcr able tyrosine kinase that is the hallmark of CML, but it also has some activity inhibiting a couple other tyrosine kinases, one called CKIT and one called uh, PDGFR. There are tyrosine kinases that are implicated in other whole bunch of other pathologic processes. And some folks understood this and started using this drug uh, for gastrointestinal stromal tumors with absolutely dramatic results. I can remember prior to this trying to treat people with gastrointestinal stroma tumors with standard chemotherapy and it did not work. And these people died miserable deaths. And now you uh, place these people on an oral pill and these, these uh, tumors can melt away in six to eight weeks. It's just incredible. So, uh, so the tyrosine kinase area, which we have linked with CML all these years, um, uh, also has an origin in, uh, in soft tissue sarcoma uh, work. So, um, we are currently in the immunotherapy era, right? So if you've done any reading or pay attention to what's going on in oncology, we're in this immunotherapy era where we now think that almost every cancer we are able to treat by immunotherapy. You've seen ads on TV for Opdivo or Keytruda, and you probably have learned already about how those drugs affect the PL1, P1 uh, uh, regulation of T cells and whatnot. Um, very interestingly, uh, those drugs are not all that effective in soft tissue sarcomas, but I will tell you this, that, that the first origins of even thinking about immune therapy for 
soft tissue sarcoma, I'm sorry, for, for cancers, dates back to people who were doing sarcoma work in the 1890s. A uh, guy by the name of William Coley, a surgeon uh, in the 1890s, started using uh, streptococcal toxin and injecting that in and around sarcomas as a method of, of, of mounting an immune response to treat sarcomas. And of course, this was likely long before things like IRB boards and whatnot, but, uh, <laughs> but, but um, there's interesting work going back to the 1890s about the use of, uh, of immunotherapy for starting in sarcomas, you know. Um, all right, enough of that. So uh, epidemiology of soft tissue sar sarcomas, so many of these occur de novo. Um, there are some uh, uh, genetic familial uh, predispositions. Lee-Fraumeni syndrome, uh, ab inherited abnormalities in P53 is probably the one that you're most familiar with. Uh, neurofibromatosis uh, can lead to uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Um, uh, people who carry the retinoblastoma gene, of course, get retinoblastoma, but also have an increased risk for soft tissue sarcoma. So there's certainly genetic predispositions. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. Katie Dusenberry today about the use of radiation to treat sarcomas, but radiation can also be something that causes sarcomas. So um, in particular, we see this, uh, the, the most common scenario is in women who have had radiation for breast cancer, the development of angiosarcomas in that radiation field. Chronic irritation, chronic lymphedema can lead to, uh, uh, to soft tissue sarcomas. And of course, we've already talked about, uh, about Kaposi's sarcoma, and I didn't mention, though, that, that Kaposi's sarcoma is a viral-induced cancer, so it's a human herpes virus 8-induced uh, uh, cancer of endothelial cells, sarcoma of endothelial cells. Um, click and presentation of soft tissue sarcomas in a large mass. Um, you have to remember that, that, um, uh, that soft tissue masses are most commonly benign, in fact. It's uh, benign things like homas, uh, terminal fibromas, etc., are 100 times more common than soft tissue sarcomas. And one of the challenges that we have is how do you improve the early diagnosis and recognition of a needle in a haystack, of something that's really uncommon? You know, and we've actually been toying with a lot of medical record to develop some ways to try to, to try to improve that. And ring sarcoma has been working on ways to educate primary care physicians and others to increase the awareness of presentations of, uh, of soft tissue sarc sarcomas. But in large mass, the typical distribution is thigh, buttocks, upper lower extremity, apparently a case of the torso, the retro peritoneum, head and neck. Um, Rain sarcoma has come up with a red flags card as a way to, um, to uh, hand out these to, uh, to uh, healthcare professionals to improve the recognition of soft tissue sarcomas, looking at any lump or bump really appearing anywhere, enlarging over time, involving deep tissue or superficial, essentially a, a mass greater than five centimeters almost anywhere in the body should be considered as potentially a, a, you know, a, a worrisome abnormality and almost any deep lesion deep to the fascia. We'll hear more about that from Dr. Ogilvy, who's, who's in the room here as well. Um, I have uh, this slide up here. This is one of the monographs from NCCN. Are you guys familiar with NCCN? Probably something to, to take some time to, to, um, to become familiar with. Uh, www.nccn.org has uh, essentially a uh, open compendium of guidelines for the evaluation and treatment of almost any malignancy that you can think of. And, um, uh, a quality metric for oncology programs is how closely they adhere to NCCN guidelines. That's how, that's how um, important these guidelines are, so to speak. I just wanted to kind of show you just briefly what these guidelines look like. You can spend some time going to that website and, and uh, learning more. But if you look at, at um, a session for a presentation of, of someone with a soft tissue sarcoma, so prior to initiation of therapy, all patients should be evaluated and managed by a multidisciplinary team with expertise and experience of sarcoma. So uh, that includes surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, um, adequate image of the tumor, uh, carefully planned biopsies, uh, and then, of course, appropriate histologic evaluation of those biopsies. Uh, since many soft tissue sarcomas uh, 
have metastatic presentations going to the chest, some form of chest imaging, uh, oftentimes with CT is important as well, and of course, useful under certain circumstances, has to do with genetic counseling and, uh, and, and uh, other things. And then, based on uh, the histologic subtype, there are certain guidelines for uh, how to approach treatment. I'm not going to go into that, but I want to use that as a, serve that as that as a reference to you for for further learning. Um, I want to take the uh, last slide here to just talk about the TNM staging of soft tissue sarcomas. Again, you're familiar with the tumor node metastasis guidelines and the AJCC 8th edition, which just came out in the last year or so. Uh, what I want to point out is that, is that grading is also part of, of the staging as well, which is quite unique to soft tissue sarcomas. We really don't do that with lung cancers or colon cancers or, or breast cancer. We don't include grade in the staging itself. Um, T primary tumor is, uh, so T1 tumors are tumors five centimeters or less, uh, either superficial or deep. T2 tumors are greater than five centimeters, uh, regional node involvement, uh, and then of course distant metastases and grading. You can see how different stages of soft tissue sarcoma have to do with the TEM, and then eventually M staging as well as the grading itself. So um, I think that's uh, enough. And in summary, we know that uh, sarcomas are rare tumors with a diverse subtype and, uh, and pathogenesis uh, historically significant. Um, warrants a high index of clinical suspicion when evaluating uh, soft tissue masses. And of course, I um, have a bunch of resources for you for uh, learning more about evaluation, and treatment, and staging. Um, if you have questions at all, or we just move on to another presentation, what do you think, Scott? Into the staging, is that was that study done been scientifically proven to be helpful, and is it not helpful in other cases of yeah. different cancers? So, so um, uh, all the evolutions of the AJCC staging try to develop stages that will, uh, or, or try to separate cancers out that will have prognostic significance. So the bottom line is yes, is that, um, is that in soft tissue sarcomas, we know that grading has a huge prognostic significance uh, in, in some respects, maybe even more than size of tumor and location, you know, that is not so much the case. I mean, it's to some degree, but not so much the case in, say, um, uh, colon cancer, where uh, where a well differentiated, moderately differentiated, poorly differentiated uh, colon cancers, that distinction is not as important as whether there are lymph nodes involved or not. So, a colon cancer that has uh, lymph node metastases uh, has a, a much worse prognosis than a colon cancer of a higher grade without lymph node metastasis. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 